Olá, boa noite. Boa noite. Estamos começando a homenagem ao professor João Batista Ferreira de Mello. O professor geógrafo João Batista Ferreira de Mello nos deixou em 10 de julho de 2021. Pessoalmente, as saudades são do meu orientador, mas também do amigo e figura paterna, tanto que me deixou duas irmãs acadêmicas, Melissa Anjos e Olga Figueiredo. Foram quase 16 anos de convivência, em que Batista se empenhou de maneira ampla em minha formação, guiando-me pelas alegrias e dificuldades da carreira acadêmica, assim como fez com dezenas de bolsistas e orientandos. Lembro perfeitamente do primeiro encontro na Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Era a primeira aula de Geografia da Cidade do Rio, disciplina eletiva, ministrada em um auditório cheio para 100 pessoas. Eu estava atrasado. Aquele homem alto, voz grave, impostada, me passou a impressão de uma figura austera e eu fiquei assustado. Não tive coragem de entrar. Na segunda aula, cheguei na hora, direitinho. E a primeira impressão se desfez. Meus olhos brilharam. Como era possível tanto conhecimento sobre a cidade do Rio de Janeiro, articulando música, cinema, literatura, irreverência, sensibilidade? Sentado no auditório, eu não sabia direito que era isso do Rio ser o nosso lar, nosso lugar. Mas tive no corpo a sensação de que eu estava entendendo imediatamente quis me aproximar do professor. Alto, grande, uma figura sólida, sinceramente, parecia eterno. Com o João, a sensação que me tomava era de um universo se abrindo. Às vezes não sabia para onde ia, mas me sentia totalmente acolhido e seguro. Depois entendi que era João Batista, ele mesmo, o próprio lar, lugar. Já eu, Ivi, conheci o João Batista primeiro pelos textos. Sua abordagem me parecia vivaz, feliz, profundamente comprometida com as suas bases teóricas. O primeiro texto que eu me lembro de ter lido se chama a Geografia da, da Grande Tijuca na Oralidade, no ritmo das canções e nos lugares centrais. Mas conheci o João pessoalmente mesmo, num CBG, um Congresso Brasileiro de Geógrafos, em 2014. Ficou a meu encargo, junto com Virgínia e Lucelena, organizar pelo GUM, esse grupo que aqui oferece esse evento, um espaço de diálogos e práticas. Qual era o convite? João Batista Ferreira de Mello e Werther Roser dialogando <risos> sem nenhum tipo de script sobre a geografia humanista brasileira. <risos> Pioneiro e paralelamente iniciado por ambos nos anos 90. A perspectiva de ver essa conversa me deixava excitadíssima, porque o João, a essa altura, já era uma grande referência para mim, já que assumidamente um tuaniano, e eu implantava um projeto de, de extensão inspirado no Nega Rio, aqui na minha universidade. E eu disse tudo isso para ele num longo e-mail de convite, que carregava um pequeno absurdo. Eu pedi a ele para pagar ele mesmo a ida, a volta e a hospedagem dele em Vitória. Qual foi a resposta? Um dia depois, um e-mail completamente em branco, com o seguinte título. Convite feito, convite aceito. Ainda não entendi direito, mas acho que será super legal. Abraço, Batista. Daí em diante, eu descobri que o João escrevia todos os textos de e-mail no campo do assunto. Era assim mesmo, Letícia. É, apaixonado, João, né? Apaixonado pelo, como ele gostava de dizer, olímpica e maravilhosa cidade de São Sebastião, do Rio de Janeiro, de São Jorge Guerreiro. Ufa! E eu peço já licença a Douglas Poco. Mas, na simbiótica relação entre pessoas e ambiente, Batista era Rio de Janeiro, e Rio de Janeiro era João Batista. Bem, ele era inseparável, é, ele era inseparável, né? ele não separava o modo de existir e logo de pesquisar. E, portanto, pensar tinha desdobramento prático. 
E isso significa estar na cidade e pensar no, com, pela cidade. O que, acabava, o que acabou né, refletindo em sua farta produção bibliográfica acerca do Rio de Janeiro, sua toponímia, seus símbolos, harmonias e dissonâncias. Boa parte dessa experiência pelas ruas, do, pelas ruas cariocas foi no famosíssimo projeto Roteiros Geográficos do Rio, atividade que eu tive a honra de ser o primeiro bolsista oficial de extensão. Vocês podem imaginar o um encanto de um jovem do subúrbio carioca, aos 19 anos, que se perdia no cruzamento da Rio Branco Presidente Vargas com João Batista Ferreira de Mello? Bem, é, se você não sabe qual é esse cruzamento do Rio de Janeiro, pense em um cruzamento óbvio na cidade de vocês. Pois então, eu sabia nada da cidade. E pude conhecer todo um universo com o João Batista. Agora, pensem na expressão no rosto daqueles que sentiam um frescor em redescobrir as geografias do Rio de Janeiro. Falando em Nega Rio, em 2012, logo depois de um segundo como esse, nós fizemos um roteiro do Rio com o João. Eu estava completamente absurdada com aquele encontro, quieta, tímida, admirando os maiores geógrafos humanistas brasileiros andando pelas ruas do Rio. Eis então que a Lúcia Helena Feliz e Faceira se vira para o João e fala João, essa moça aqui, a Letícia, está fazendo uma tese sobre o Tuan. Você sabia que ele era geomorfólogo? O João, aquele homem imenso, com um megafone <risos> na mão, se encurva sobre ela e diz Não foi! Aí Lúcia me cutucou e disse Vai lá, fala para ele que você pesquisou e que ele foi sim. Eu me acovardei, não falei não. Fiquei quietinha. Esse foi nosso primeiro furtivo encontro. Mas vocês se lembram que eu acabei de dizer que conheci o João pessoalmente em 2014. Mas João me conheceu pessoalmente em 2016. Aos 67 anos, João foi fazer pós-doutorado com Eduardo Marandola de Marandola, como ele gostava de dizer, <risos> no Unicamp lá de Limeira. Em um dos eventos que nós fazíamos por lá, João me vê chegando no hotel com Virgínia, se curva bem perto do meu rosto e diz, quem é você? Letícia, professor. Letícia de quê? E alguém diz, Letícia do Tuan. Ele logo me deu um daqueles abraços enforcantes e disse, eu sei quem é você, a única geógrafa do Brasil que conhece o Tuan, e o Tuan conhece de volta. Eu te amo. João, para quem não sabe, sofria de prosopagnosia, que dificultava o reconhecimento de rostos. A partir dali, ele me conheceu e nos falavam semanalmente. Foi amor à primeira vista, mas à primeira vista do João. E abertura para a vida tem que ter uma pessoa que aos 67 anos ainda quer começar a estudar e se aceita a fazer novos amigos. João, é, João gostava de desbravar e descortinar, não a só a cidade e suas camadas de densidade simbólica, mas novas abordagens, sendas luminosas de pensamento. Assim o fez com a precursora dissertação O Rio de Janeiro dos Compositores da Música Popular Brasileira, uma introdução à geografia humanística, 1927-1991 com a orientação do Roberto Lobato Correia, professor da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Como sabemos, posso afirmar ter sido o primeiro trabalho assumidamente em geografia humanística à época. Em seu belo trabalho, que atingiu imensa repercussão na mídia por destacar o cancioneiro carioca, João estava preocupado em desvelar a cidade íntima de cada compositor com o que ele mesmo chamou de literatura musicada, buscava realizar o que considerava um dos propósitos da geografia humanística, qual seja entender a alma dos lugares a partir da perspectiva dos indivíduos e grupos sociais. Ao lado disso, vale destacar algumas iniciativas que lançaram luz a certos geógrafos e conceitos do horizonte humanista em geografia, 
como os artigos Descortinando e Repensando Categorias Espaciais, com base na obra de Futuan, sua principal referência e inspiração, cabe dizer, Valores em Geografia e o Dinamismo do Mundo Vivido, na obra de Anne Butchmann, de 2005, Símbolos dos Lugares, dos Espaços e Deslugares, originalmente publicado em 2003, difundindo a proposta da tradução para o português de Placelessness, de Eduardo Ralph, depois recebeu outras traduções, como a do professor Eduardo Marandla, e essa tradução já estava presente em sua dissertação de mestrado. Outro conceito que o professor é, utilizava muito era o balé do lugar, assim como traduziu o conceito de David Simon, e era um conceito muito presente em seu pensamento, interessado que era na coreografia urbana do dia a dia. Aliás, João Batista certamente ficaria muito orgulhoso por poder abrir para um dos seus geógrafos de referência. Por falar nessa dissertação, não é, Ivo? Ela foi escrita ainda nos tempos das máquinas de escrever e das pouquíssimas e caras fotocopiadoras. Ter uma cópia dessa era praticamente um tesouro nas mãos. E eu me lembro quando eu contei para ele a primeira vez a minha saga para conseguir uma cópia que eu ainda não tinha, ele olhou, gargalhou alto e saiu cantando um samba sem me dar resposta. <risos> É, bem João Batista, né? E eu estava falando aqui de alguns é, textos e eu ainda é, que gostaria de lembrar também o firme Geografia Humanística, a perspectiva de, da experiência vivida, uma crítica radical ao positivismo, publicado em 1990 na Revista Brasileira de Geografia, e o inspirador A Humanização da Natureza, uma odisseia para a reconquista do paraíso de 1993. João, João Batista era atravessado. João Batista era atravessado por pulsares urbanos e sonoros. Era um especialista em música popular brasileira, fã do repertório nacional, especialmente o samba. Como entendia não haver separação sujeito-objeto, defendia que nossa experiência era um todo indissociável. E não só era impossível apartar o fazer científico do estoque de conhecimento e trajetória individual de cada um, como era mesmo desejado. Nesse compasso, Batista, marlenista convicto, escreveu a instigante tese dos espaços de escuridão aos lugares de extrema luminosidade, o universo da estrela Marlene como palco e documento para a construção de conceitos geográficos, também orientado pelo professor Lobato. Nessa pesquisa, João defende os indivíduos nos espaços geográficos, não como forma de mapear o mundo um para um, penso eu, mas buscando na trajetória de uma pessoa de imenso relevo artístico aquilo que pode nos dar a pensar a pedagogia dos conceitos geográficos. Marlene, a maior, como Batista fazia questão de frisar, foi uma artista múltipla, cantora e atriz. Certamente, muitos de vocês conhecem a música Lata d'Água, que é o seu maior sucesso, ainda da era do rádio. Mas a carreira de Marlene foi muito além disso. Cantou Bossa Nova, Samba de Protesto, Tropicália, esteve em turnê com Gonzaguinho e protagonizou peças de sucesso, como Ópera do Malandro, de Chico Buarque, e Botequim, de Gianfrancesco Guarnieri. É, Ivo, eu acho que o João vivia mesmo em estado de música. Cantava em seus áudios para os amigos, nos convidava a assistir e vibrar nos concursos de Misses, seus jogos de basquete, de preferência do Vasco. João era para cima, era pulsão da olímpica e maravilhosa São Sebastião do Rio de Janeiro. João era gigantesco, aberto, ensolarado, mas ensolarado só depois do meio-dia, porque amanhã nunca existiu para o João. João Batista Ferreira de Melo era apaixonado pela vida e viveu plenamente. Superou dificuldades das quais praticamente ele nunca falava ou reclamava e se tornou esse imprescindível hiperbólico representante ou apresentante da geografia humanística em respeito a ele. Nos deixou com um aperto no peito, uma saudade imensa e um grande legado. Entre os mais importantes deles, para mim, está o Ivo, que aqui nos fala. 
Uf. João Batista, <risos> obrigado, Letícia. João Batista proclamada, proclamava ser tomado por uma uergifilia. Devemos lembrar do termo topofilia, cunhado por Ifutuan. Atado por laços de pertencimento à Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Sentia-se em casa, assim como todos nós, tendo habitado por quase 15 anos o núcleo de estudos e pesquisas sobre espaço e cultura, o NEPEC, coordenado pela professora Zeni Rosendal e pelo professor Roberto Lobato Correio, tendo sido, inclusive, um dos editores do renomado periódico Espaço e Cultura. Do NEPEC fez parte até 2010, quando fundou o Núcleo de Estudos sobre Geografia Humanística, Artes e Cidades do Rio de Janeiro, o Nega Rio. Deixa uma centena de orientandos. Em seu legado, uma obra manifesta de transgressões, uma trajetória livre de amarras e de medos. Salve João Batista Ferreira de Mello. um pouco sobre essa observação do Geiger, que a observação do Geiger assim, se existe alguém que faz geografia cultural de verdade, é o João Batista, falou que isso? traz ah, a cultura. disse o professor Pedro Cristian Geiger, não é? E eu fico muito grato, ele disse que eu trago a cultura para a universidade, não ao contrário. Esta é uma proposta da, da geografia humanística, exatamente trazer de fora para a universidade. Ela é diferente, não, é, não, não há hipóteses, não há, não há leis, não há... É, não é, é, teorias prontas acabadas na geografia humanística. Então, nós temos que trazer realmente de fora para, para a universidade né, os elementos que estão é, para a gente trabalhar na universidade. O, o professor é, Pocock, é escocês, ele diz que na simbiótica relação entre homens e meio ambiente, lugares devem ser considerados como pessoas e pessoas como lugares. Eu sou um apaixonado pelo Rio de Janeiro, então eu procuro sempre trazer o Rio de Janeiro nas minhas pesquisas, é, é, nas suas mais diversas dimensões, escalas. Né? É o Rio de Janeiro, minha paixão nos meus trabalhos. E também trago os artistas que eu amo, eu também trago né, os ritmos expulsários. Então, eu procuro trazer esses elementos para a 
para a universidade. A noite no centro da cidade não é só para conversas em bares e restaurantes. É também uma boa oportunidade para se conhecer a beleza da arquitetura e um pouco da história do Rio. Um passeio pelo Rio Antigo. A maratona turística criada por professores e alunos da UERJ. Na certa, você já ouviu Noel Rosa, Adoniram Barbosa. Mas e Custódio Mesquita? Cláudio Honor Cruz, Vadico, Haroldo Lobo? Pois é, também são grandes nomes da MPB e que comemoram este ano o centenário de nascimento. Eles foram lembrados hoje aqui no Rio como uma homenagem que foi uma viagem pela história da música popular brasileira. Quando o sol se põe, as luzes se acendem, o Rio de Janeiro revela encantos que vão muito além das praias. Um projeto da Universidade Estadual leva moradores e turistas a um passeio noturno pelo Centro Carioca. A reportagem é de Sandra Passarinho. No escuro do centro da cidade, se destacam as luzes da Igreja Presbiteriana do Rio de Janeiro, inaugurada em 1862. Uma beleza que muita gente mal sabe que está aí à disposição. Andar pela cidade à noite é mais fácil em grupo, mais seguro. Mas é preciso também mostrar o outro lado do Rio de Janeiro, como nós vemos nessas horas que caminhamos à noite, de um Rio de Paz também. É uma cidade belíssima, dá de voz ao nosso lar, ao nosso lugar, né? a nossa geografia que pulsa com intensidade e merece todo o nosso carinho, todo o nosso respeito. Sim, nós estamos no Beco das Cancelas. Por que Beco das Cancelas? Porque havia uma cancela ali que você pagava o pedágio para ir para a parte mais nobre da cidade. O Morro de São Carlos, né? É, a que agora foi reformada e é uma biblioteca parte. Vamos ver depois, né, gente? Todo mundo do passo, né, a gente vai, eu também não foi ainda. Nada propositadamente pesado, né, do tempo do Estado Novo. O Estado Novo foi a ditadura, a ditadura de 37, 45. Ao nicho de Santana. Santana, que aqui tinha igrejinha. O metrô é bem anterior, né? Era pra você passar aqui de baixo da Avenida Presidente Marcos. Estamos, estamos de braço, né? Certo? De casa da moeda, que agora já há alguns anos. Aquela rua Marquês Sapucaí, ela era mais estreita do que isso aqui, o espaço público. Ainda há 11 casas em Santo Cristo, da rua Marquês Sapucaí. Bem, como visto, estamos aqui na Ladeira da Misericórdia, uma das nascentes do Rio de Janeiro. Primeira rua do Rio de Janeiro, primeira também a ter algum tipo de calçamento. Esse calçamento, pé de moleque. Quando ressurge a cidade nova, é, com essas torres no mapa, a... a... A memória simbólica permanece. Muitos usaram óculos escuros e chapéu para enfrentar o sol e ouvir o professor. É extremamente importante para todo carioca né, conhecer a história da sua cidade, né, sua, é, preservar a sua memória, como o professor disse. Né? Essa velha que ia derrubar, agora eu entendo que tem que ser preservado, tem que ser a, é a nossa memória. Então, isso eu acho que é muito gratificante. Os alunos ficaram muito contagiados, isso foi surpreendente, é ótimo, né? Então, se a gente tocar música brasileira, com música de primeira qualidade, ela pode ter grande ressonância. Esse, nessa empreitada que é a, a, a nossa redescoberta dessa geografia, né? que nós também redescobrimos a geografia do Rio. Né? O Rio é muito rico, a cada esquina você tem uma história, você tem um contexto para ser traduzido, decodificado. As vantagens para, para, é. com esse título, eu acho que nós temos Mas, vantagens sim, para o turismo, é. né? temos vantagens para a própria autoestima do Carioca. Ah, 
não é? Eles contribuem muito. E nós temos outros trechos, porque, na verdade, foram alguns trechos selecionados para o Rio ganhar esse título de é. patrimônio mundial. Nós temos ainda a Floresta da Pedra Branca. O Rio é uma cidade de muito prestígio, né? de é. muito... Uh, uh, né? Você tem ainda a Floresta do Mendem Gericinó, a Mas Bahia de Sepitiba, que é uma... Sabe? Três é. florestas urbanas, duas baías. Né? Você tem Restinga de Marambai, que é. merece também... Não é ser, é, então nós podemos reivindicar no que vem Regina, mais não, outros trechos do Rio. O Maurício Mendes de Oliveira, do grupo Geoprofessores. Os professores de geografia perguntam, assisti a aula com ele na pós-graduação. Muito bom, na verdade foi um comentário, né? A Mônica Frazão... Ah, foi meu aluno. Foi seu aluno, olha só, está prestigiando aqui o nome, professor. Não, 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 não. A Mônica Frazão, via WhatsApp, pergunta, gostaria de saber que atividades posso propor para os meus alunos conhecerem mais a geografia do Rio. E aí, professor, o que que, quais atividades ela pode propor para os alunos dela? Essa atividade, você sair às ruas e também adentrar em ambientes que sejam importantes, não é? Essas atividades são muito ricas para as pessoas conhecerem a cidade, conhecerem o seu bairro, conhecerem a sua rua, o seu bairro, a cidade, não é? Então, no bairro, você pode fazer, no entorno do colégio, você pode fazer um roteiro, uma atividade de campo. Né? Você pode levar também as crianças ao, ao Rio, mostrar que ele está assoreado, como, é, mostrar também como a cidade está suja para que não, não, é, para que não joguem lixo no chão. Não há razão de ter lixo no chão, na é verdade. Em Tóquio, não há cestas de lixo na rua e as ruas são muito limpas. Então, essa educação que você pode dar, esse reconhecimento também, você pode fazer é, é, da cidade para que as pessoas amem mais a cidade, não é que, afinal, a cidade é o nosso lar, o nosso lugar. Enfim, o pessoal da geografia humanística. Há uma crítica de que eles são muito teóricos não vão para a empiria. O Tuan consegue isso. Você também. Não, não pode me, me filmar de... Pode. Não, de corte não pode. Não pode de lado, porque eu sou magro. <risos> para todos, a gente faz esses roteiros tentando contribuir para a autoestima. Muito obrigado. Esse é o um momento glória a ser aplaudido nos jardins do Museu da República. <risos>
porque ele também vai falar da trajetória dele para vocês. Ele se doutorou em geografia em 1977, orientado por ninguém menos que Anne Buckner, é professor de comportamento ambiental e estudos do lugar no Departamento de Arquitetura da Kansas State University, em Manhattan, no Kansas, Estados Unidos. Na verdade, se aposentou em 2020, né, ano passado. Trabalha com geografia comportamental e a pesquisa de comportamento ambiental, se interessa pela abordagem fenomenológica dos lugares, da arquitetura, da experiência ambiental e do design ambiental como criação de lugares. Os principais temas de interesse do professor Simon são aspectos humanos do design, lugar e criação de lugares, a natureza das experiências ambiental e arquitetônica, a estética ambiental e arquitetônica, a mídia artística como meio de compreensão do ambiente, lugar e natureza, teoria e prática da totalidade do Christopher Alexander, a sintaxe espacial do Bill Hiller, especialmente porque essa abordagem ajuda a compreender a copresença humana, o encontro e a regularidade dos lugares, a fenomenologia da natureza, desenvolvida por Goethe, e a fenomenologia como método de investigação nas ciências humanas e do comportamento ambiental. É, alguns livros dele, em tradução livre, do título são Uma Geografia do Mundo da Vida, Habitar, Lugar e Ambiente, Caminho da Ciência de Goethe, Uma Fenomenologia da Natureza, e o mais recente deles, E a Vida Acontece. Ele edita também uma deliciosa revista chamada Fenomenologia Ambiental e Arquitetônica, que já tem 32 anos de publicação, e quem quiser conhecer, a sua obra está toda generosamente colocada na Academia Pontedu, incluindo seus livros. Professor Simon, We couldn't be more happy and honored to have you here today. It has been one of my dreams for the last six years for my research group to meet you in person. Of course, this online mediation was not part of my dreams, but I'm very thankful that it exists, exists and makes it possible. You are live from YouTube now, and uh, you have as many time as you wish in your lecture, and afterwards, I will select and translate three questions for you. Again, thank you very, very much for this time. <laughs> oh, Leticia, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Uh, tell me, are you just seeing my face at the moment? Yes, your face. Okay. So, is it all right if I put on the title slide for the lecture? No? Of course. All right, so let's see if it works. Uh, wait, let's see. Oh, just a minute here. Okay, no problem. Oh, chair. Chair. Yeah, for some reason it's not. Oh, I see. I've got to hit that. All right. Now, do you see it? Not yet. Oh, dear. Now it's going. Yes, now it's okay. There it is. Yes. It's so hard to believe that I'm in. Kansas in the United States, and you're seeing this there. It's really remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do feel a bit disembodied. Now, let me just tell you, everyone, uh, I'm sitting at my dining room table, and I have three cats sitting on the table. So one of the cats may suddenly appear in the picture at some point. So if you see a cat, don't worry. It's, uh, it's this crazy technology we have they are invited to yes well they're listening yes. welcome <laughs> yes yes the phenomenology of kitties i i like it very much all right now first of all i want to sh i want to uh thank uh leticia for inviting me um we met about six years ago Uh, as many of you know, uh, Leticia did her dissertation on the humanistic geographer Ifu Tuan, and she was visiting uh, Ifu in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And one day, out of the blue, she called and she said, "You know, I'd like to come down and visit you." And I said, "Fine." So she came down, and I think she spent two days here in uh, Manhattan, Kansas. And we had a lovely talk, and she uh, described her dissertation work on Ifu's work. And obviously, Ifu is one of the major figures 
in uh, humanistic geography. All right, now let me start. Uh, I've called this talk Humanistic Geography, Phenomenology, and Place. And Leticia, am I coming through okay? Perfectly. You can hear me fine. Okay, good. Yes, we can hear you and see your slides, Excellent. your presentation, okay? Um, as uh, many of you know, there is this relationship between humanistic geography and phenomenology. And one of the major topics that has come forth in humanistic geography is place. So I thought it would be useful to draw these three themes together. And that's what I'll be focusing on in the talk. Particularly, I want to talk about my latest work uh, covered in a book which I've written called Life Takes Place, but we'll get to that later in the talk. I thought I should say a little bit about my personal history as a geographer. Now, you may have noticed <laughs> it's a rather odd situation, you know, that as a geographer, I was, I'm in a department of architecture. And I need to explain how that happened, but I will. But before I get into that, I wanted to say something about my professional chronology. Uh, I, 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 I began my graduate work at uh, Clark University, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts, in the northeastern part of the United States. And back in the 1970s, uh, Clark University, particularly the geography department, was a uh, major center of humanistic work. And it was a very interesting situation as to how that emphasis unfolded. Now notice, I started my graduate work there in 1970. And frankly, I only chose Clark University to do my graduate work because that particular year, 1970, uh, Clark gave uh, stipends, which were the most money. I had applied at Penn State, I had applied at Columbia, another, a number of other geography programs, and I chose Clark largely because they said, oh, well, we can give you, I think it was like $2,500 a year, which was a lot of money in those days. So the first point I would like to make here is that going to Clark was almost entirely serendipitous. I had no idea really what the program was about. It was just good luck. But the other bit of good luck in 1970 at... Um, Clark, whoops, was um, the fact that Ann Buttimer arrived that year as a postdoctoral fellow. And as many of you know, uh, Ann, Butter, Ann Buttimer became a major figure in humanistic geography. And uh, luckily for me, she was there because I don't know that I could have continued my graduate work because at that point, the early 1970s, uh, quantitative research was still the dominant approach, and you more or less had to do some kind of uh, quantitative uh, thesis to uh, continue in the program. So luckily, Anne was there, and very early on, I did a seminar with Anne, and Anne was an interesting character because she too had become somewhat disillusioned with the quantitative emphasis in geography at that time. And she had been looking at alternative ways of um, study. So for example, she had uh, studied at the Husserlian uh, archive in Belgium. She was very interested in phenomenology at that point, also existentialism. And out of that interest, she would publish uh, several key works, uh, Values in Geography, which was published in 1974, and probably her premier work, in my mind, the finest thing she ever produced, uh, the 1976 article in the Annals of the Association of American Geographers on the Dynamism of the Life World, I think, uh, writings in the history of architecture. So I was able to work with Anne 
while I was doing my graduate work. And the other point I want to bring up here is that during this period of time, it was also quite interesting because the two largest graduate programs at Clark are psychology and geography. So in the late 1960s, the early 1970s, there was an effort to create an interdisciplinary program between the psychologists and the geographers. So as a graduate student, I was able to take um, classes not only from geographers like David Lowenthal and Ann Vodimer and um, Bob Cates, key figures in uh, what was called at the time uh, environmental perception and behavioral geography, but I was also able to take uh, seminars in psychology, working with people like um, O. Robert Beck and uh, uh, Kenneth Craig, who were both major figures in environmental psychology at the time. So there was this wonderful uh, dialogue between the psychologists and the uh, geographers. And also, interestingly, there were quite a number of um, graduate students who'd, who had been trained in the design professions, because at that point, uh, architecture, environmental design, urban design, interior architecture, there was a great amount of interest in the whole uh, environment behavior work that was unfolding during that period. So I finished my uh, dissertation in 1977, and that was called, um, what was it called? Um, I think it was called Movement, Rest, and Encounter, a Phenomenology of Everyday Environmental Experience. And I rewrote that dissertation, and that was published in 19. 79 as a geography of the life world, the cover of which you see there on the upper uh, left. And then, oh, for several years, I guess you would say I floated around like so many um, recent dissertation folks do. And uh, I taught, I had a number of visiting physicians. Uh, also, I had a postdoctoral fellowship at one point at uh, uh, Lund. University in uh, Lund, Sweden, because at that point, Anne Buttermer was there working on what she called the Dialogue Project, which was an effort to uh, interview and videotape uh, older geographers and other social scientists. And uh, that was partly under the direction of uh, Torsten Hagerstrand. Anyway, I was in Sweden for uh, two years. Then I came back, did a bit more of uh, visiting teaching. And eventually, and again, this was entirely serendipitous, I uh, took a uh, tenure track position at Kansas State University in the Department of Architecture, because at that point, um, many architecture programs were sponsoring faculty in environment behavior research and that's what I advertised myself as, and that and, and, and that is what I was hired as. Um, these are the kinds of courses that I have taught at Kansas State, State during my career there. Um, architects, other designers, they're very, very interested in this question of how the designed environment contributes to uh, human well-being to uh, human life. And uh, these are some of the courses I taught, uh, Environmental Design and Society, which is essentially an overview of environment behavior research. This is a course required for all second year architecture students. And I taught a number of um, upper level um, seminars, uh, one in environmental aesthetics and another in uh, theories of place and placemaking. So these are the kind of um, teaching ventures I moved into uh, because of my background in geography, in uh, behavioral geography, in uh, humanistic geography. So these are some of the themes, I would say, um, focus my writing and research, the significance of place in human life, 
environmental design is placemaking the nature of environmental and architectural experience, architectural and landscape meaning, the whole question of home, dwelling, and journey, which is particularly a gnawing theme today when we speak of globalization and this continuous uh, mobile mobility uh, that so many people face today, whether we're talking about forced mobility or mobility because of uh, continuous shifting of uh, employment. And finally, the practice of a lived environmental ethic. This is, this is a theme which I have written about uh, quite a bit. So most broadly, I would say that my research focus is a phenomenological approach to environmental and architectural topics. As I was saying earlier, uh, Ann Buttermer, at the time she began at Clark, U Clark University in 1970, was questioning the current uh, geographical emphasis on uh, quantita uh, quanti quantitative work uh, positive, positivist science and so forth. And um, one of the major conceptual approaches that she uh, got me interested in was uh, phenomenology. And um, once I learned about phenomenology, I have really taken it on as my, uh, uh, my uh, conceptual understanding of what research should be and uh, how uh, research should proceed. And, you know, some people have have said, and I sort of like it when they say this, they say, oh, well, you're, you're a zealot about <laughs> phenomenology. And yeah, okay, yeah, there's some truth in that because I do think it is the most useful uh, conceptual tradition that Western philosophy has provided us, and I'll say more about that as I move ahead. I'm very interested in keeping track of phenomenological work, and since 1990, I have edited or uh, co-edited co a newsletter called Environmental and Architectural Phenomenology, in which we try to keep track of uh, publications, uh, conferences, uh, book series and so forth. And uh, this is online. If you, if you Google it, you can find it readily online. And uh, we used to publish it three times a year. Now we publish it uh, two times a year because we've moved to uh, uh, digital only. And most recently, I have been uh, um, working out my phenomenological interest by writing this book, Life Takes Place, Phenomenology, Life Worlds, and Placemaking. And it's really a portion of this book that I want to give uh, the majority of my time speaking uh, this evening. However, I thought I should say a little bit about um, the uh, trajectory of humanistic geography. And I thought, let me start out with a definition of geography as I would provide it. And obviously today, the field of geography is so wide ranging. Very often I look at one of the geography journals and I look at the article and I say, wow, <laughs> I didn't even know this was geography. Uh, the range has become so um, wide. Now, I would define geography as a discipline, as the study of the earth, as the dwelling place of human beings. Certainly in the humanistic work, that word dwelling, at least in the early work, uh, was very important. And uh, this whole question of understanding how uh, places in the world become uh, homes become uh, dwelling situations for human beings. Um, I think you can look at the history of geography and say that this is a major thrust uh, in all uh, time periods. Humanistic geography. Now, obviously, in humanistic geography, 
uh, we bring attention to the uh, human dimensions of geographical phenomena. Uh, now, I like what Paul Cloak says about humanistic geography, bringing human beings in all of their complexity to the center stage of human geography. I think that's a very useful uh, quotation for focusing the core of what humanistic geography is about. Now, it is true, this point of view can be found in earlier geographical work. Uh, we can go back to Alexander von Humboldt. We can go back to uh, Grano. Uh, we can read people like uh, David Lowenthal and J.K. Wright. And we find uh, inklings of what humanistic geography brings forward uh, more directly. The other interesting point here, of course, is that this idea of understanding human beings' situation in relation to the geographical world, uh, it's, it really does start out with, um, with um, the early environment behavior researchers. And I want to, I'll, I'll highlight some of them shortly, but these are some of the ways we can uh, focus some of the key aspects of humanistic geography. Uh, the importance of uh, human experience and meaning in understanding people's relationship with places and geographical environments. And notice here, experience meaning. Now, this is a very interesting uh, um, polarity or binary, uh, experience versus meaning. Uh, and, and, and the humanistic geographer is interested in both of these. But there are differences, there are commonalities. This is a very interesting question. You know, does meaning uh, facilitate experience or does experience facilitate meaning? This is a kind of chicken egg question for which I don't think there's any final answer. But it is an interesting question. And of course, meaning has really largely been looked at by the so-called uh, representationalist and representational geographer, geography. The belief that meaning is largely uh, conscious, uh, cognitive, uh, cerebral. Now, the phenomenological understanding of meaning is somewhat different, but that's a whole lecture. So I just say ex both experience and meaning are integral aspects of what hum humanistic geography focuses on. Now, you could also bring in the word behavior or action. Uh, so it's it's a very complicated uh, situation. And a focus on such geographical phenomena as space, place, home, mobility, landscape, region, nature, human-made environments, and so forth. Let me highlight uh, four features of humanistic geography as I uh, laid them out. I was asked to do an encyclopedia um, entry on humanistic geography a number of years ago for that, uh, oh, I don't know what it's called, the Wiley AAG Encyclopedia. So I wrote an entry. And then just last year, I had an email saying, oh, well, why don't you update? And I thought, well, how am I going to update an entry on humanistic geography? But I did. And uh, anyway, in, uh, in writing this uh, encyclopedia entry, I highlighted these four features of uh, multidimensional understandings. This is a very important feature of humanistic geography, which makes it different than the, um, the earlier environment behavior work, the behavioral geography work, the environmental perception work. Um, in other words, uh, there are a wide range of ways in which the scholar can approach the topic of study and uh, define the topic of study. And one key point that humanistic geography makes is that human experience is multivalent. In other words, there are many different dimensions to it. Uh, it's not only cognitive, it's not only bodily, it's not only emotional, it's not only transpersonal, it's all of those things. 
And uh, somehow we have to be comprehensive in our approach, in our understandings. Open empathetic methods. Uh, this, of course, is where phenomenology became very important because one of the major aims of phenomenology is to be open to the phenomenon that's being studied, though there are other methods which attempt uh, this empathy as well. First-hand experience. Now, obviously, if you are an analytic positivist geographer, there's no way you can draw on first-hand experience. It's said to be anecdotal. It's said to be subjective. It's said to be untrustworthy. Now, the phenomenology approach says, well, you know, first-hand experience is one kind of evidence of, of, of a phenomenon, assuming you can experience that phenomenon. Now, obviously, if you're doing a phenomenology of blind people's experience and you aren't blind yourself, well, you can't you can't draw on firsthand experience, but uh, much of the time it is possible to make use of firsthand experience, particularly as a starting point for the work that you're doing, because you, you can write out as thoroughly as possible your firsthand experience of the particular uh, phenomenon you're studying. And that is one way to begin to um, focus, clarify, direct the uh, research you're going to do, let's say by interviewing others about the same phenomenon. Explication, interpretation, uh, and interpretations of social worlds. It's very interesting how, how the trajectory of humanistic geography shifts. The earliest humanistic geographical work is, is largely explications of experience. And it's marked by the work of um, Yi Fu Tuan, uh, Ted Ralph, and Buttermer. They really were the three key um, researchers. But over, but over time, there becomes a move toward uh, the interpretation of social worlds. And this starts fairly early on. Um, David Lay is one of the first persons working in this direction. And it's very interesting how that sub-tradition of humanistic geography moves into uh, post-structuralist geography, feminist geography, um, uh, social constructivism, uh, and later into assemblage theory and so forth. Now, I am strongly um, a part of uh, the explications of experience. That's really my coinage, uh, mostly because of my, my um, dedication to a phenomenological uh, perspective. As I was saying, um, there are uh, antecedents for the humanistic work. And uh, one group of antecedents is the environment behavior research that really begins in the late 1950s, uh, reaches its glory period in the 1960s, uh, largely disappears in the 1970s, as uh, at least in geography, the humanistic work becomes much more dominant. But anyway, looking back at this early work, obviously one of the big, big influences here is architect Kevin Lynch's image of the city which, golly, when I, I started graduate school, that was such a prominent um, work. And uh, golly, I think I had to read that book in at least three different seminars. It was just a, a kind of mini god at that point. And of course, Jane Jacobs' work, particularly The Death and Life of Great American Cities. At that point, that book, well, now Image of the City had been published in 19... 61, as had uh, Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities. It's very interesting, the year 1961, how, how, how important it was for um, environmental behavior research. And then, of course, there were other works like uh, Bob Summers' uh, Personal Space, 
I've got a picture here of uh, Edward Hall's uh, Hidden Dimension. There were a number of other uh, key works uh, during this period. And the point I'm trying to make here is that from one angle, this earlier work sets the stage and really probably allows the humanistic work that begins in the 1970s, um, allows it to uh, actualize. And in terms of the uh, early humanistic work, uh, I've already mentioned Ann Buttermer. Uh, certainly Ifu's work is important. Uh, his first book, or well, it wasn't his first book, but it was his first book in terms of the humanistic approach, Topophilia, literally love of place. That was a very important work published in 1974. And I think the work that has had the most lasting prominence of this early humanistic work is uh, Edward Ralph's Place and Placelessness. This to me is one of the great works in the history of ge geography. And it's so interesting how this work, th uh, this book continues to be cited and to me, if you want one book introducing students to uh, the phenomenology of place, it's Ralph's Place and Placelessness, which is the book to offer because it's uh, accessible. It's uh, beautifully uh, outlined. It has a very simple but uh, effective outline. And it generated a number of phenomenological concepts like uh, insideness and outsideness, which um, has become the basis for a large amount of uh, phenomenological and related research. I thought I should say something about what phenomenology is, because there may be some of you out there who have no idea and can barely uh, say the word, talk about wondering what it's about. I remember mentioning it to my mother once and she said, forget it, I don't wanna know anymore. The word itself scares me to death. Okay, but I think phenomenology should become a word that everybody knows. Uh, and uh, most simply, I would define phenomenology as the careful description and interpretation of human experience. Now, it's much more than that, obviously. And if any of you have looked at the phenomenological writings, you know that many of them are very, very dense and difficult. Um, and in some ways, I'm troubled by that because I do think there are ways of uh, explicating phenomenology that are accessible to almost anybody who can read. I mean, I, I really do try to write simply and clearly in my uh, articles and books. But it is true, uh, there's so many phenomenolo phenomenologists who just, oh, I mean, it might be, writ it might be written, it might, uh, the book might be, uh, you could, it could be written in Martian, you know, it's just so hard to fathom. Now, uh, phenomenology is interested in phenomena, and a phenomenon is anything or experience that a human being can experience. So a phenomenology of place, one of my central interests. But you can have a phenomenology of landscape, a phenomenology of love, a phenomenology of anger, a phenomenology of uh, out-of-placeness, uh, a phenomenology of um, weather, uh, a phenomenology of climate. It's interesting, in the last few years, there have been a number of phenomenological studies on weather and climate. So um, this essentially is what phenomenology is about. And it is true that the um, discussion of phenomenology and phenomenological method are quite sophisticated, complex, difficult. However, for me, even though we can talk about method, we can talk about uh, phenomenological concept, concepts like intentionality. To me, uh, the two most important uh, notions, concepts in phenomenology are life world and natural attitude. It's really 
these two concepts which made me interested in phenomenology because I had never seen anyone describe these phenomena before. And yet I remember, golly, as early as when I was four years old, you know, I always wondered, well, how can it be? The world is always around me a minute before I can catch it being there. You know, how, how can this be that, that I'm not myself, but I'm also the world that I always find myself in? And that, 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 that always burned in my head, you know, how, how that could be. And it's really, at least in the Western, philosophical tradition that this this uh, taken for grantedness, this uh, always already immersion in the world at hand, uh, it's only the phenomenologists who have recognized this situation. And of course, uh, this was first recognized by Edmund Husserl, who is usually identified as the father of um, phenomenology. And I've always wondered how he realized these concepts. I, I don't think he wrote about that anywhere. I'm not sure about that, but it is curious. Anyway, so what are these things? Life world, the taken for granted pattern and context of everyday life. The uh, other side of the coin is the inner aspect of life world, which is called the natural attitude the unquestioned acceptance of the things and experiences of everyday life. In other words, the natural attitude is the unquestioned acceptance of the life world. In other words, most of the time, we don't give any attention to the fact that the, life, that the world simply happens. It just unfolds. We don't have to do anything. Now, it is true, occasionally the life world is ruptured in some kind of way. Certainly, COVID is a good example of that. You know, in the life world, uh, we used to be able to have face-to-face -face interaction all the time. Suddenly, that taken for grantedness is lost as we have to practice social distancing. So, it is... It is, um, it does happen sometimes that in the life world, we can become aware of the life world. But you have to understand that awareness is still within the natural attitude. You know, we're, we're becoming aware because, uh, because what we take for granted is, is, is upset. But normally the life world is taken for granted. And in that sense, it's hidden. It's out of conscious awareness most of the time. Now, of course, what the phenomenologist tries to do is make the life world and natural attitude objects of uh, research attention. And this is what's called the phenomenological attitude, making the life world, making the natural attitude a focus of scholarly attention. And I like the way that uh, Andy Georgi says this. Andy Georgi is a major figure in... Uh, phenomenological psychology. Notice what he says here. The acts that in the natural attitude are simply lived are now thematized and made topics of reflective analysis. So attachment to place, for example, that's a uh, life world phenomenon for many people, not everybody, but for many people. So what we do is try to uh, make attachment to place uh, a research topic and begin to describe it in some detail. And this bring, brings us to this issue of uh, phenomenologies of place and some of the key questions that can be addressed in relation to this topic. Um, how and why are places important in people's lives? Now, some of you may say, well, you know, today we're so mobile. We're moving around so constantly. You know, is place even a significant phenomenon anymore? And that's a very important research question. What happens to people uh, when they are continually moving from place to place? What, what is the impact on the people 
And what is the impact on, on the places that have to endure this constant uh, change? What is the nature of place experientially? What humanly and environmentally transforms spaces and environments into places? And of course, that becomes a very important for the uh, design people, the architects, the urban designers, the interior architects and so forth. I wanted to say a little bit about the key uh, works in uh, Phenomenology of Place. Now there's a large literature on this today, but I do think uh, one can highlight these four works as particularly uh, prominent and uh, influential. And you'll notice on the upper left, uh, Place and Placelessness by geographer Edward Ralph. I've already mentioned that it's probably the most accessible phenomenology of place, one of the clearest and one of the earliest. I would also um, mention uh, philosopher Edward Casey's work. He's written extensively on place and lived in placement. Uh, the work by Casey I like the best is getting back into place. I think that's not a very good title, but that's the title he used, so be it. Now, that book was first published in 1993, and uh, it was uh, released as a second edition in 2009. And that second edition is particularly good because it has several new entries, uh, and some of those new entries are very good summaries of... Um, of um, uh, what place is phenomenologically. Now, Ed Casey also wrote The Fate of Place, which is a history, a philosophical history of the concept of place in the Western tradition. And that's also good, but uh, I, I don't like it as much as getting back into uh, place. Another key figure here is uh, the philosopher Jeff Malpas, who's Australian. Uh, he's a Heideggerian scholar. And he's written a number of books on Heidegger and place. But uh, my uh, favorite work of uh, Jeff Malpas is Place and Experience. And uh, this was first written in 1999. And uh, there is a second edition now published in 2018, which has, I think there are two new chapters. And uh, uh, that's very good, too. But, oh, golly. Reading Jeff Malpas is an ordeal. Oh, he is so dense and cerebral. It really is a chore to read Jeff's work, but uh, it's worth it if you can <laughs> if you can eventually follow it. But oh golly, I you, you won't you won't understand it reading it just once. You really gotta work for that book. Ed Casey is sort of like that too, but. No, Ed is like kindergarten compared to Jeff Malpas. Jeff Malpas is the hardest. Now, I would also recommend uh, Bob Mugerauer's work. Um, he's another philosopher. Bob is an interesting character because he's the only he's one of the few philosophers I know who have ma who have mastered the environmental and architectural literatures. He knows what's going on in geography as much as he knows what's going on in philosophy, which is very unusual for a philosopher. They're usually quite parochial and only uh, read and cite other philosophers. And Bob is an exception. And uh, particularly good by Bob is uh, Interpretations on Behalf of Place, 1994, but still quite, quite uh, useful. And then finally, I would mention uh, Ingrid uh, Lehman Stefanovic's work. Um, Ingrid. Golly, she's one of the earliest uh, philosophers discussing the significance of place in human life. And uh, one book by her I like especially is called Safeguarding Our Common Future, which is essentially a phenomenology of place, though you wouldn't know that from the title. But anyway, um, it's another uh, important phenomenological work. Uh, dealing with uh, place. Now, how would a phenomenologist define place? Uh, now, each phenomenologist is going to do it differently. 
And this is the definition that I have used. Any environmental locus in and through which individual or group actions, experiences, intentions, and meanings are drawn together spatially and temporally. Now, the key here is drawn together. This is what is so fascinating about place as a phenomenon in human life and as a, as, as a concept in academic study. It has this gathering quality that it takes many different features, things, uh, situations, events, and all of those items are drawn together spatially and temporally through the phenomenon of place. So, for example, this photograph on the left, um, this is by the great um, Hungarian-American photographer, Andrei Kertes, who I've written about extensively because I like to argue that his photographs uh, portray the life world um, visually. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but in this, more or less in the center, there are two men on that back balcony of that walk-up uh, apartment building in uh, New York City, Greenwich Village, and they're having an intense conversation. So you have this wonderful quality of uh, centeredness and privacy, and the world of those two men being gathered, brought together there, drawn together, while the hubbub, the uh, life of uh, greater New York City, uh, greater West Village, is simply happening. And I think this is a very nice uh, photographic rendering of the core quality of, of place and lived emplacement, that there's this gathering of all these things spatially and temporally. And this is another uh, Cortez photo. And again, I don't know if you can see, but there's this little fellow here on this back balcony and he's reading a magazine or book or something. But you can see he's very much at home. He's very contained, contented, peaceful, probably enjoying himself reading. And uh, you have, you know, the anonymous uh, uh, roof structures, chimney structures of greater Paris uh, surrounding him. It's, it's a very nice uh, picture of, uh, of, of, of place. This is a uh, quotation from Ed Casey. And it's one of those quotations, I think, uh, it, you can read it over and over again and gain something from it. It has great weight, great density. Um, let me read it here. By virtue of its unencompassability by anything other than itself, place is at once the limit and the condition of all that exists. To be is to be in place. And I think as geographers, it's very important for us to realize this lived fact that there's no way one can escape place, that we're always in place. It may be the farmhouse we've lived in all our lives. Uh, it may be a hotel room in which we've only uh, spent a few nights in. It may be as small as a phone booth. It may be as expansive as the rim of the Grand Canyon. Whatever, wherever we are, we're always surrounded by a world. We're always emplaced in that sense. Now, very often this emplacement is temporary, like living in the hotel room for a few nights. For many people, however, this, empla this emplacement is permanent. It, it could even be the world that uh, they were born into and grew up in and still live in when they're 80 years old. Um, but whatever. Uh, we're always surrounded by this world, and one way to define this world is, is through the phenomenon of place. All right, now that brings us to uh, Life Takes Place, and I did want to say a bit about this book. 
the major focus of the book is a phenomenology of place and place thinking. But more centrally, the major portion of the book is asking the question as to what places are processually or generatively. In other words, how do places change over time? Are there underlying um, underlying uh, what word do I want to use here? I don't want to use the word forces, but underlying um, aspects of life world, of being human in the life world, that help describe how it is that a particular place uh, livens up, declines, remains more or less in stasis. This is a very important issue I bring up in the book because, um, well, one reason I wanted to look at this theme is, is because as far as I know, there aren't any uh, thorough discussions of this question as to how places change over time. And I think this is a very important topic because we can ask how we make places better if we begin to understand what the underlying processes are that trigger uh, changes in place. So, so that was the um, what justification for what I was hoping for here. Also, in the book, I'm trying to present an understanding of place and lived emplacement, which holds on to this gathering quality of place. And this is what I call in the book, a perspective which holds to what I call synergistic relationality. Now, I'm not going to spend time defining synergistic relationality after the talk if anybody wants to ask about it, I can say more. But I do want to bring forward this quotation from uh, Jeff Malpas because it, do, it does highlight what I'm trying to get at. And again, this quotation is very, very difficult. Probably it won't make any sense to you the first reading. But again, I think it, 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 it's just one of the great uh, sentences in the history of phenomenology. And notice what he says here. Place is constituted. In other words, place is, you might say, constructed, made. Place is constituted is a word that phenomenologists use. And it's a good word, but I want you to understand that's what it means. Place is constituted through a gathering. Now notice there's that word gathering. Gathering of elements that are themselves mutually defined only through the way in which they are gathered together within the place they also constitute. Notice what he's saying here. This is really quite remarkable. He's saying that the quality of gathering precedes the elements, the situations, the actions, the things, the events in the place. This is really a remarkable idea that the wholeness in other words, the unfolding, the gathering. Um, it, it, it's that, again, I don't like the word force. It's not really a force. It's a what? It's a quality of, 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 of the human world, really. That's what it is. Uh, or a quality of the world or of the life world. And so um, in looking at um, place as process and this generative aspect of place, um, I was essentially asking this question, how do places and place experiences shifting over time? Are there underlying lived processes that impel the ways that places are what they are and what they become? So this is what well, not all of the book, but the last half of the book moves into this question. And the conclusion I reach, and I don't want to get into the derivation or the justification of this, though I do do that in the book. And if you're interested, you can, you can look at the book and see how I derive 
this result, which is these six place processes, which are all interconnected, interrelated. They're, they're one way of thinking about the, uh, the power of the gallery. And I call them uh, place interaction, place identity, place release, place realization, place creation, and place intensification. And it is important to understand they are all interconnected. So for example, strong interaction leads to strong identity and so forth. And I picture them uh, graphically as this uh, Star of David, but this it isn't a really good way to do it. And it would be much better to try to visualize it like that, that, that these processes are continually uh, interacting, overfolding, uh, interfering with, strengthening each other. So that's why you see, I, I sh this, isn't this is probably hard to see, but notice all these, uh, these tan lines in here. They look like yarn, ball of string. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get the sense that they're continually uh, shifting among. Yeah. Now, what I want to do is, is, is describe each of these briefly and then come back to this idea of gathering. So that's where I want to go. And uh, here's a summary chart that you can look at if you like to. Now, th let me say that most of these are, are nothing dramatic. But what I'm trying to do is the typical phenomenological um, aim, you know, to, 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 to take aspects of the life world that are typically hidden out of sight, not noticed, and bring them to attention. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Place interaction. I mean, golly, you know, a kindergartner could figure that out. It's true. Yeah. So what are we talking about here? The typical everyday goings on in a place. Uh, the rounds of a place, a day in the life of the place. And one of the best examples of place interaction is uh, Jane Jacobs' street ballet, which is a notion that I have uh, generalized in terms of place ballet. But her idea of an exuberance of sidewalk and street life founded on the everyday comings and goings of many people carrying out their own ordinary needs, obligations, and activities with the result that they meet on the sidewalk, they meet in the street, and you have this uh, liveliness of place. So this is a very interesting aspect of place interaction, you know, that it plays a foundational role in why one place is quite robust and lively, whereas another place is rather dead with very few people uh, moving through it or using it. So this is, uh, this is uh, place interaction. Oh, and let me just say, now there, uh, this would be a fascinating dissertation, phenomenologically, you know, to do, let me just say you could do a phenomenology of each of these six uh, um, processes. Uh, so for example, place interaction, you know, some of them are habitual, they're everyday, they're taken for granted, they happen over and over again. And then there are other interactions which happen rarely, they happen once in a lifetime. Uh, some of these interactions are um, habitual, some of them are uh, intentional, uh, some of them are um, mundane, ordinary, rather humdrum. Others are dramatic, surprising, uh, quite amazing as an event. So you see, there's quite a range of um, possibilities here in terms of uh, interactions in place. Place identity. Now, this is something which is being studied more and more today, particularly in terms of what is called place attachment. There are a large group of uh, environmental psychologists that particularly interested in place identity and place attachment. But the point I want to make here, which I think makes it somewhat unique, is the phenomenological aspect of this, that uh, part of who we are is where we're placed. You know, as Ed Casey just said it in that quotation, to be is to be in place. And I think uh, geographers especially should be probing this in much more detail. 
how being in a particular place uh, contributes to how we understand who we are. Accepting and recognizing place is, an, is integral to one's personal and communal identi identity. And even today, you know, we, we usually, when, when we introduce ourselves, we usually say where we're from. We, not, we, we may not be happy with where we live. We may be only living there for a short time. But even so, part of the way we identify ourselves is, is through the question of where we, where we live. And uh, it, this is one curious uh, indicator of uh, place identity. Place release. This, uh, this was one of the most intriguing uh, processes which came out of this work. And frankly, this topic has not been studied very much at all, even though once you know what it is, you say, well, golly, it's, it's such an integral part of what place is about, what lived in placement is about. And th this relates to um, environmental serendipity. In other words, um, living in a particular place, uh, these unexpected events transpire because of that place. Now, my graduate work at Clark is a good example, you know, just by chance, I ended up going to Clark, and just by chance, uh, Ann Buttermer came there as a postdoc fellow the same fall semester that I started my graduate work. It was because of that place and the serendipity of the two of us just happening to be coming there at the same time. But sometimes place release is, um, is humdrum, you know, uh, it, it's not that significant. Uh, but at other times, let's say, you know, you, you, you meet your significant other uh, standing in the line waiting to get a sandwich from the local sandwich shop. <laughs> so, so place release can have remarkable um, importance in human life. As I say, that's rather unusual. But it can happen. Now, I call it place release uh, because I, I, I didn't know what to call it. So uh, notice what I say, he, I say here. People are released more deeply into themselves through gaining pleasure from, from place. So there's this idea of uh, these uh, serendipitous moments, these uh, happenstance events, giving a bit of pleasure. To everyday life. One point I should make right now is that for all six place processes, they can undermine place as well as strengthen it. So for example, if you're mugged in front of the entrance to your apartment, <laughs> you know, that's, that's bad. <laughs> That's bad place release. You know, I, I don't want to give the suggestion that all of these processes are, are, are positive. No, they have both, both potential uplift and potential um, uh, erosion in relation to place. It's very important to keep that in mind. Place realization, and this is another one I don't think Geographers have given as much attention to um, the phenomenon of place as they might. And, and this uh, relates to the palpable presence of place and the way that places can order, can structure a particular world. You know, like fast food restaurants are a very good example of place realization in the sense that every little bit inside the fast food restaurant, McDonald's, for example. You know, it's controlled. It's been figured out beforehand. Uh, the, the service staff, they have to perform in a very regimented way. 
even putting a pickle on the hamburger has already been predetermined by the uh, McDonald's uh, uh, manual. Uh, um, um, customers, they know what to do when they come into McDonald's. You know, they, they look at the menu. Many of them already know what they want. They put the uh, main item first, usually the hamburger, then the french fries, the desserts at the end. Uh, they know they walk up to the counter. Uh, they, they know the whole, the, the whole performance of that particular place is, 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 is pre-ordered. And uh, many places are like this. They, they have this quality of ordering. And also related to this is, uh, is um, the, the, the less tangible aspects of place, the fact that many places have a powerful sense of place, uh, a powerful spirit of place. Uh, we're talking about ambience and atmosphere here. And um, again, a place can have a negative atmosphere. Uh, so, um, we come into this point that all of these uh, processes are both, they can be both good and bad. Place creation. Uh, this is a situation where people who are aware of their place uh, work in constructive ways to make it better. It might be through design, it might be through policy, it might be through planning, whatever. The whole possibility that through committed understanding, committed actions, committed work in relation to the place that one is uh, involved with, that that place can be strengthened. And this is what's called place creation. And then finally, uh, place intensification. Now, this is a very interesting process too. And curiously, this goes way, way back to when uh, geographers argued for what was called environmental determinism, the argument that uh, the geographical environment was active in human life and uh, human actions, human behaviors, uh, human worlds were the passive result of the uh, geographical environment. Now, what this process is saying is that even though the non-human environment is passive most of the time. It's just a lifeless stuff that human beings can manipulate. There are situations where that passive physical environment can affect, can afford particular human actions. So we're talking about the power of plans, designs, and fabrications to work as an independent agent in strengthening place. And uh, this is a very simple example. Uh, this was a pedestrian island in New York City at uh, Madison Square at uh, Broadway and uh, Fifth Avenue. And it was a relatively small traffic island that people would stop as they were crossing uh, Broadway and then Fifth Avenue. And um, Notice how it was uh, redesigned. And this small traffic island was made much larger into this triangular uh, vest pocket park. And this has become a very popular event, outdoor venue for so so sociability today. But it's a very nice example of how um, urban design can uh, shift qualities of place and in this case, make, make a, a place which before was simply a, a small concrete island that nobody stopped on. Uh, so so th this, this particular process refers to the fact that the passive physical geographical environment can be active. Of course, the... Um, the 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 shift here was generated through uh, place creation 
but once the traffic island was redesigned, uh, you have a viable, actually robust um, city plaza, which wasn't there before. So uh, that is a quick overview of the six processes. And again, I do want to emphasize that each of these six processes has a uh, has an undermining side. So for example, with place interaction, the typical interactions of place become fewer, they become destructive. The pleasure of being a part of the place is undermined through discomfort, stress, nuisance, inefficiency, fear, and so forth. And uh, for each of the six, there is these negative, uh, there, there are these negative possibilities. And I'm not going to go through all these. I think most of them are fairly obvious once you start thinking about them. But I do want to stress that uh, these processes can downgrade a place or they can uplift the place. And you know, that was one of the most uh, satisfying aspects of locating these six place processes, um, th that they could work in both positive and negative ways. Now, we, we, we could think of the history of a particular place in terms of how these six processes interweave over time. Um, and this is a, a, a graphic from the book. And I say here, uh, this diagram illustrates the places of the world as an incalculable number of overlapping, interconnecting, and interacting tubes in which a continuously shifting web of the six place processes work reciprocally to strengthen, undermine, or maintain place. One pictures an inestimably complex web of variously scaled places, some nested within others, some colliding in destructive conflict, others coalescing in constructive integration, others never or rarely engaging. Now, this is obviously artificial because it only portrays one place. And another dilemma here is obviously places are nested. So you have a favorite chair in your um, bedroom, which is in your house, which is in the neighborhood, which is in a city, which is in a region, which is in a country. There's that nesting quality. So there's no way graphically that you could picture this. Also, you know, often places are in conflict or they're uh, exchanging in some kind of way. So, 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 so this is this is this is entirely in terms of one place, which, as I say, in the real world is never the situation because every place is somehow interconnected with other places. But conceptually, for convenience, I, I uh, generated this um, this simplification. Now, I want to come back to this idea of gathering. I mean, this is what I hope the six place processes illustrate, this gathering quality of place, that you have this uh, interweaving uh, exchange, uh, intimacy among the six processes. And this brings us back to Malpas. Place is constituted through a gathering of elements that are themselves mutually defined only through the way in which they are gathered together within the place they also constitute. And I'm trying to illustrate some of this gathering through the six place processes. Now, are they valuable? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, one potential use they might provide is um, looking at one specific place in considerable detail using the process, processes as a guide. I think also the processes might be valuable in comparing uh, places. For example, comparing uh, two adjacent neighborhoods, one of which is uh, deteriorating socially, physically, and the other is um, strengthening itself. So I think uh, 
they might be a useful conceptual guide for studying specific places. Uh, also, I think they might have some value for thinking about how one can uh, make places better through uh, design, planning, advocacy, which um, puts the place first and thinks through what it might be through place creation. And in the book, actually, I in, in the chapter on place creation, I, ident I, I discuss a number of um, design and policy examples, which I think um, illustrate uh, possibilities in how one can understand a place better and therefore uh, contribute to authentic place creation for that place. All right, now I think I will stop there because um, I did want to give you some sense of where my recent work has been moving, and I and I hope this idea of looking at place processually and generatively is of value to you. So let me stop there, and I think now what we're going to do a few questions. Now, shall I turn this off? Hello. Yes. Hello again. <laughs> Hi. Now, what should I do? Should I turn off the PowerPoint? There's no need. Someone has, has already done it. Oh, okay. It's just the two of us again. Oh, okay. So let me go. There you are. Okay. Oh, and there's my cat. See? Yeah. <laughs> answer the questions. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's a much more handsome guy than me. Look at that. <laughs> I think you're like a bull. <laughs> hey, this is good. <laughs> Nice to meet you. A year old, and he's a very sweet boy. Says, yeah. "Boy, I'm going to be a kitty star now." <laughs> up on YouTube. Whoa. Yes. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Simon. We have many people on YouTube chat, commenting and cheering. Uh, you gave us a very generous and clear explanation about place, geography, phenomenology. Some are also cheering from the cats, for the cats. <laughs> Again, it's an honor for us. I'm going to read some questions, and I'm going to read them first in Portuguese and then in English for you, okay? okay. First, we have Valeria. Valeria, pessoal, diz, ela pergunta, é, Hugo, não sei se dá para você projetar aí, Recentemente, no Brasil, houve, houveram alguns desastres ambientais ocasionados pela mineração e fizeram desaparecer algumas comunidades tradicionais rurais. Mas as pessoas que vivem ali conseguem descrever vividamente seus lugares. Você acha que é possível dizer que um lugar pode morrer em termos fenomenológicos? Ok, não em inglês? Recently, in Brazil, mining environmental disasters have vanished some traditional rural small communities. But people who live there can vividly, vividly describe their homeland. Do you consider possible to say that a place can die in phenomenological terms? Well, well yes. I mean, you know, a place, it has a starting point. And no doubt it has an ending point. You know, all, all places today at some point in the future will be gone. Um, so yes, uh, places can die. And of course, I think w w one of the interesting phenomenological questions is, uh, first of all, why, why is it that a particular location for a place is chosen? And that gets us into the phenomenology of the founding of a place. But we, we could also do a phenomenology of the death of places. And it would be very interesting to select um, places that for whatever reason have, have disappeared. Now, the, the other interesting topic here is places that uh, were near death, 
you know, like New Orleans after Katrina or uh, Chicago after the great fire of 1871. Uh, this is another fascinating topic. What, what, what are the human forces that, um, that provide the momentum for uh, recreating these places? Um, and I, I don't know any studies of that. There, there is one book, and I've forgotten her name now. I'd have to get the reference. Uh, she does look at um, uh, human generosity in times when places are under threat. So, for example, she looks at the generosity of people in San Francisco at the time of the, of the Great Fire in San Francisco. I've forgotten what year that was. I think it was in the 18th. 1870s, but I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, that question, it brings forth a wide range of possibilities uh, phenomenologically. Now, in terms of these folks, you know, I don't know what's happened to them. I suppose they've had to relocate and probably it's largely been traumatic. Um, and that's another whole question, looking looking at situations where uh, people have been uh, relocated and, 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 and finding out what has worked and what hasn't worked. I believe there are already a number of studies on that. That's not a topic I, I know thoroughly, but I'm quite sure there is a good amount of research there, um, though I don't think there's much phenomenological work. There is one interesting phenomenological study which was done back in the 1990s, and it was a study of, um, of ranch families in Alberta, Canada. And those ranches that these families owned were inundated by a dam that was constructed there, and the families had to move. And this researcher, her name was Louise Million, uh, she lived with these families. She interviewed them. The interviews are remarkable. Uh, the, the stories they tell, um, you know, about these families losing these these ranches that they had lived on for generations. And it's a very a lot of sadness in it, of course. But of course, a lot of human endurance in the stories too. So uh, that that's a very good uh, question. But yes, I think, you know, someday, uh, whatever, uh, you know, like Brasilia, I mean, probably Brasilia will die more uh, sooner than uh, Rio de Janeiro or, uh, or, uh, or New York City, uh, simply because it's an, it was, it was, it was, it, it's an artificial place originally, right? I mean, it was, it was um, constructed artificially in a sense, like Canberra in Australia. I mean, I don't know how strong uh, a sense of place those those capitals have. I've read stories that Brasilia is, is, is so much of what was originally envisioned by Brasilia isn't what has happened. So. Thank you. I'm going to translate it to Portuguese, your answer, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. I probably said too much. No, it's okay. I'm going... That's a good question. Let's start out there. I'm going to summarize it. Okay. Somehow. <laughs> Sorry, I have to remember the next question. I'll keep it. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, I can go on forever. That's my problem. <laughs> Valeria e pessoal, é, eu, eu vou resumir, né? Vou tentar resumir a resposta. Ele disse que sim, que na verdade todos os lugares um dia vão morrer, né? É, alguns já desapareceram, que ele acha que tem poucos estudos a esse respeito. É, mas que é uma abordagem fenomenológica muito interessante, e que outros estudos já foram feitos sobre cidades que estão na eminência de desaparecer, como aconteceu com o furacão né, em New Orleans, como aconteceu com o incêndio, o grande incêndio de Chicago e também o grande incêndio em São Francisco. É, mas, e aqui é, é possível também contar muita história de como as pessoas ajudam esses lugares a resistirem, né, é, ele lembra também de um, um estudo particular feito por uma pesquisadora chamada Louise Milian, em Alberta, no Canadá, ela estudou e morou com pessoas que perderam seus ranchos centenários ali, 
foram deslocados, né, e que é, têm entrevistas e, e relações muito vívidas das pessoas com esses lugares. E ele considera que lugares artificiais, como, por exemplo, Brasília, né, que tem menos sentido de lugar, provavelmente vão morrer antes de lugares que, como o Rio de Janeiro, que se construíram né, mais, é, digamos, naturalmente, né, não foram de maneira tão é, artificial. Quem não... Ah, não, em, em português, nós temos mais uma pergunta aqui, dessa vez do Hugo. Hugo, se você puder projetar, por favor. Ele pergunta, nós poderíamos pensar na arte como uma potência para compreender ou refletir sobre o place release? Now, David, uh, in English, it's a question from Hugh, our tech guy, with, he's also an undergrad student, okay? He's doing his dissertation right now. Uh, he asks, is it possible to think about art as an output to understand or to think about place release? Uh, wait, what, what was it, art as what? As an output. Oh, okay. So say it again for me. Is it possible to think about art as an output to understand or to think about place release? Well, yes, I think so. Um, you know, it would be very interesting to look at the history of art as, um, as these moments of uh, surprise, happenstance, serendipity are portrayed. Now, you may have noticed in the presentation, I had that picture of folks standing in a group at the street corner. And I, I, I mean, I don't know what happened there. I, I used it because I got the sense from that, that painting, I don't know if you did, but from that painting that uh, the, the, these folks had come together accidentally and they were, they were hanging out there, you know, uh, enjoying this moment of surprise meeting. Uh, so I think, I think there are, um, uh, there might be artists that highlight this topic. I, I don't know. I will tell you this. There's a novel, a British novelist named uh, Penelope Lively. In almost every novel she writes, there are these there these moments of um, surprise meeting, which become pivotal for the story. So, for example, an old lady is mugged on a London street, and because of that, she, she breaks her hip and she's got to move in with her daughter-in-law, and that leads to all sorts of complications, which you know would not have happened if she, if she hadn't been mugged at the start. So, yes, I, I think, uh, now how you would go about it procedurally becomes the question. As I say, if you could find uh, one or two artists, well, maybe more, who, who, who often portray um, serendipity in their paintings, that would be one way to go about it. Um, I think also in film, I think you can probably find it in film again, I can't think of any example. Can you think any movies where, uh, you know, the whole the whole story? There is a. I know there is a movie called Serendipity. I, I I don't remember that story. I suppose that's one. So, yeah, no, but it would be a wonderful theme. But the trick would be uh, operationalizing it. You know, um, finding enough material to um, discuss the topic. Now, th there's so much about place release that can be looked at, you know, positive moments of happenstance, negative moments, uh, how qualities of the place might have contributed to it. Oh, in, in, in that regard, I should mention, there's a book that Hugo should look at. Uh, it's called, um, let me see what it's called. It's called Heart of the City. Heart, Heart of the City. And it's very interesting because the author, who's a journalist, he locates nine couples 
who eventually married, who met each, met each other accidentally in public places in New York City. So like at Grand Central Station, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, at uh, Washington Square Park, Central Park. You see, they never would have known each other if they hadn't bumped into each other accidentally. Isn't that amazing? I think. So anyway, he, he, he writes about it. It's called The Heart of the City. It's not a very good title, but that's what it's called. His name is Sab 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 Sabir, I think. I've forgotten. I recall a movie you you said uh, you said me to watch about Anne Sullivan. At the end, she she suddenly encounters water, and then all the world makes sense. Oh to yes, you. yes. <laughs> well, and you see, I mean, that's a moment which is extraordinary because she she never understood before that the relationship between the the phenomenon and the the language to describe the phenomenon. It really is a remarkable, I mean, in a sense, it, it, that's what the best phenomenological encounters are like too. I mean, I remember when I first worked through the six place processes, it, it happened like that. I, I was in a hotel in Istanbul and I think it was something about Istanbul. It has such a unique uh, quality. And suddenly I just, it, it all came together, the six. Well, that's a good example of a place release. <laughs> well, I discuss it in the book, actually. Yeah. I'm going to translate it on. <laughs> Just a minute. Sorry, oh, I talked too much again. <laughs> oh, well, can they hear, hear me give the English answer? Yeah, people can hear you giving the oh, English. Oh, so they've heard it from me. So, so yeah. they have a little bit of what I said. Okay. Yes, I'm just translating for maybe we have some public that cannot understand the English. Yeah, okay? yeah I understand. Good. Ah, uh, então, gente, é... ele falou que acredita que sim, né, que a arte pode ter um papel fundamental nos estudos dos encontros furtivos, né, dos encontros súbitos aí é, com os lugares, e que depende de encontrar artistas e estudos que, que façam essa relação desses encontros súbitos e furtivos. Ele lembra alguns, por exemplo, é, alguns pintores né, que a gente pode encontrar, ele lembra que na própria apresentação dele ele mostrou um quadro né, onde tem pessoas no telhado lendo, que aquilo, é, provavelmente aquelas pessoas não, sabe, não estavam lhe posando para uma pintura, né, e aquele momento foi capturado pelo artista, e que nesse caso só haveria o desafio de estudar né, fenomenologicamente, de encontrar artistas que fazem isso, mas... É, periodicamente, mais solidamente, né? É, ele lembra de uma, é, uma escritora de romances chamada Penélope, que faz isso com bastante frequência. Ele lembra de uma... De um, ela re, retrata um dia em Londres em que uma mulher é roubada, e aí ela encontra... A partir desse roubo, ela encontra a sua futura Nora, né? É, e também a gente relembra aqui um filme da Anne Sullivan, que é uma moça surdo-cega, né? um filme real, inclusive baseado em história real, em que ela nunca encontrou, nunca entendeu a linguagem, ela tinha uma professora, e que ao final do filme, ela, ao tocar a água furtiva e subitamente, ela se abre para o mundo. Né? Então seria é, esse tipo de tema. O grande desafio é o desafio metodológico de encontrar e revelar a experiência desses artistas com esses encontros furtivos, fortuitos ou súbitos né, do, das pessoas com o lugar. É, Anne Kelly diz, obrigada, Hugo, né, Anne Selma. Bom, é, agora mais uma pergunta, eu vou fazer a, a última pergunta, vou juntar duas, tá, do Antônio. É, como pensar lugar na geografia humanista atual em função das relações virtuais e os lugares mudaram sua identidade em função da Covid-19? Uh, ok, professor, the last question is from Anthony. He asks, um, 
he thank you for, for the lecture actually, and then he asks, how to consider place today in humanistic geography approach uh, through the virtual relations? And he asks us is if places change their identities due to COVID-19. Well, uh, the last question first, um, whether, whether real places will change dramatically because of COVID is an open question right now. I, I personally think once we get through COVID, uh, the life world lived in placement will pretty much go back to what it was before COVID. Um, you know, because I do think that um, face-to-face -face interaction is such an integral part of what we are as human beings. Now, it is true, there are quite a number of social critics saying today that the world after COVID is going to be greatly different than what it was before COVID. Now, maybe, but again, I don't think so. I just don't think that virtual reality will ever be able to completely replace the reality of real. I mean, isn't it crazy we have to say real reality today? <laughs> to differentiate it from virtual reality. It's just unbelievable. Um, you know, as somebody cleverly said, reality is our shared platform. And if much of daily life becomes virtual, how, how do we... Uh, know each other so i, I i'm not I, I i'm not I, I personally don't think there'll be that much shift now that being said the developments in virtual reality are quite stunning and there are some people who say that soon Virtual reality will seem so real that it won't make any difference whether we go to work virtually or we go to work in the real world. Though, I mean, obviously there are certain uh, activities of human life that require the real world. We have to eat. Uh, we have to go to the bathroom. Um, there are certain essentials that I don't see how the virtual, real, virtual reality can replace. Now it is true. I mean, you can see, uh, you could see some people living in a tiny little shed. It has a bathroom and a kitchen. And then, you know, nothing else because they can go to uh, the museum virtually. They can go to uh, entertainment virtually. They can go to church or mosque or wherever virtually. They can go to work virtually. Okay. I don't know. To me, though, what kind of a life is that? I, I don't see how it would work because ultimately we remain bodily beings. Now, if eventually we can we can get rid of our bodies and be brains in jars, okay, maybe it would work. But who's going to tend the brains in the jars? So uh, it, I don't see it. I don't see it will make inroads. Already, it's making inroads, and I don't think they're entirely good. But I don't see. Um, virtual reality is completely replacing real reality. Now that said, what what should humanistic geographers study? Well, I think the first important topic to study is is uh, what commonalities and differences are there between places that are generated virtually versus those that are real. You know, you 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 can. I don't think we know enough about the commonalities and differences experientially of the uh, virtual versus the real. So there's lots to look at without making a judgment for either. I think that's a very important thing. So, you know, I'm somewhat prejudiced against the virtual, uh, probably because I'm an old guy and it's all to me, ugh. Like, you know, I just got on Facebook the other day. I don't 
Facebook. What, what is it about Facebook? I think it's very stupid myself. I mean, first of all, it's poorly laid out. It doesn't make any sense how it works to me. But anyway, that's me. I'm an old guy. <laughs> I, do not, I, I don't have any social media too, so <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, you know, Facebook is nice because you do, you, do, uh, you do meet people you haven't thought about in years. But okay. Bom, I'm translating, ok? Bom, pessoal, é, ele diz que é, ele acha que há sim alguma influência, mas que não há possibilidade da virtualidade superar todas as os aspectos da realidade real. Então, nesse sentido, existe uma série de atividades humanas que dependem da, da localização física, né? depende de estar num lugar fisicamente. Por exemplo, ele diz que a gente até pode trabalhar virtualmente, mas a gente em algum momento precisa comer, precisa ir ao banheiro, então estaremos sempre localizados. É, ao final, ele diz que ele não quer não quer fazer juízo de valor, mas que é, ele, particularmente, não gosta muito do, dos espaços virtuais que a gente tem usado aí para sobrepor. Bom, pessoal, é, a gente vai encerrando aqui na, essa atividade, né? Antes, eu vou agradecer a equipe envolvida na organização do segundo, décimo primeiro segundo, Vou agradecer em especial aqui a Hugo Marandola, Tiago Rodrigues, Felipe Aguiar, que estão trabalhando no backstage dessa e de todas as transmissões, né? Desejando vida longa ao Segum, ao Algum e à Geografia Humanista. E dizendo para vocês que em seguida dessa despedida a gente vai ter o um encerramento do evento com os líderes do GUM. Eu vou me despedir antes é, de fechar aqui do professor também. Well, professor Simon... I couldn't even begin to thank you for your time, for this beautiful presentation, for your words. Uh, you, have to, you, you should know that you are an inspiration to us, and we hope to maintain these conversations and to show you how important your work is in here for us in Brazil, where human, humanistic geography grows and flourishes. We both uh, will take a break, See you maybe in 15 or to 20 minutes in our other meeting, né? Google Meeting link. If you want to, if you are too tired, okay? No, that's fine. Let, let me just say that uh, that anybody in the audience, they're welcome to email me. If okay. anybody, yeah, uh, please, no, do. Um, you know, like uh, Hugo, I, that question he asked is fascinating. You know, I've thought about it myself, so I'm very keen if uh, he wants to discuss it further. Um, the other thing is, if anybody wants a PDF of the book, uh, send me your email and I'll send you a file. <laughs> Our, some group members already asked it in the, in the WhatsApp groups and I send it. <laughs> oh, well, you've got a PDF of it, don't you? So you can send it if you want, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so, uh, which email can we put on, on YouTube? Uh, triad. Try at it, KSU. E okay. Yeah. The one I use. Yeah. Use okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Would you say a farewell too? Uh, yes. Well, uh, uh, again, thank you all for inviting me. It's, it, uh, you know, I love to talk about humanistic geography and place and uh, how phenomenology might be used to look at that topic. Um, and I, I'm so happy that there's a strong interest there. Uh, in Brazil, you know, uh, as, as you know, in North America and Europe, uh, humanistic geography isn't that uh, emphasized now. It isn't fashionable anymore. But I do think it will return. Thank Can you. you take maybe about a two-minute break, and then I'll I'll come back. Now, where do Not I go? Two, we, we can have a, a twenty-minute break. I, um, I've said. Yes, I can send you the link again on your email, okay? Wait, but how long? How long is the break? 20 minutes. Oh, 20. So shall I leave this on or what do I do? No, it, it, it's the, the other meeting will be on Google Meet. Is that that co column on the right? 
with private chat? Yes, yes. And so I'll send you on your email too, okay? Okay. All right. All right. Well, again, thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Boa noite a todos. Vamos encerrando esse seminário. Na certeza da contribuição do Grupo de Pesquisa Geografia Humanista Cultural para se pensar a geografia e as ciências, de um modo geral, é, pelos caminhos apontados pela tecnologia, ou seja, da ciência ligada ao mundo da vida, ao nosso cotidiano, às artes como expressão primeira de nossos saberes e fazeres, a novas ontologias que nos dêem esperança de dias melhores. Em breve, considerando esse tempo simultaneamente lento e fugaz, espero encontrá-los em Teresina, no 12º Seminário Nacional sobre Geografia e Fenomenologia. <música>